On this episode of Star Trek Universe, Matt and I are getting lost in a labyrinth of the mind. We are reviewing Star Trek Discovery 508, Labyrinths, right after these words from mystery programs disguised as our estranged subconscious subconscious loves. I can't say it. Welcome to Star Trek Universe, the podcast where you get to listen in on two lifelong friends sit and chat about Star Trek. My name is Matthew Carroll. I am David C. Robertson. What's up, buddy? I don't know, man. We just had a whole conversation off cast about what's yeah. up. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know I, what to say what, now. Now it's like, what do you? What do you? What's up that you want? That you want the people to hear? Oh, you know, like this is uh, the this is the performance of the friendship that we that we have for the people. Oh. So what what? So so what's the what's the version of you you want to express to the audience? There is no fictional uh version of me that I want to, you know, perpetrate upon our audience. Oh, okay. I've been sick, my stomach's all messed up, but it'll be all right, I guess. Uh x-rays yeah. came back uh, clean, so Well, see, you say there's no fictional version, but that sounded way more optimistic than the other version. <laughs> <laughs> but you made me laugh i always sound optimistic when you make me laugh man. you know how that goes who, who is this whole it'll be all right though dave <laughs> oh well you know i also consider dying to be okay it'll be gotcha. all right yeah. it'll be all right it'll be all right one way or the other the world will keep turning you know? <laughs> uh, under or over dirt one way or the other yeah. um okay well, uh, let's talk about this uh, Labyrinths <laughs> episode of uh, Disco. All right. Um, uh, you want to go first? You, you want me to go first? I feel... Uh, I, go for it, Dave. You, 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 you I liked give your, it. Give your thoughts. You liked it? I did. I liked it quite um, a bit, actually. Okay, okay. I liked parts of it a lot. Okay. I liked parts of it a lot. Um. I, the the main thrust of the episode, though, I must admit, was a little frustrating for me. Oh. And I understand <laughs> the need for these, like, this cabal of people to, like, test their, uh, I don't know, ability to protect it. Like I guess their intentions to protect it, but this felt like I don't know. It was it did not feel like having her realize she was scared and understand her own fear and all that stuff did not seem like the most cogent way to like test a a person to like understand their uh, intention or ability um, to to protect the progenitor technology. Do you know what I mean? Um. I feel like it's not just one test, it's all the tests. Sure. And sure, considering sure. that they've gotten here from all those other tests, like they've proven themselves worthy. So it makes sense that a beta Z scientist would have a test that equates with feelings yeah, and would have sure. a test that uh, required whoever was searching for the clue to not only be. Uh, honest with other people, but honest with themselves about who they are and what their motivations are. And I liked that. I liked that a lot. Yeah. I liked the, so, so here's the thing. They are scanning her brain with enough fine tuning to understand like everything about her. Like, What's the most important thing to her? The mission. What's the most, uh, you know, who's the most important person to her book? They know all about Tilly. Like, they understand her entire brain to a fine-tuned degree of understanding, like, how to reinterpret it and reproject all of the things that they want to on, in, onto her, right? Not, not um, necessarily. I think that's something you put onto it. I, well, I, what, what do you mean? I don't the, think that's something I put it onto is, I think it's, it's a program. She's running it. That's why she said at the end, like, oh, this is me. Like she's been, she was in charge of the program looking like book. She was in charge. Well, of, I know, but the program had to read her mind to project those things. Right. Like that's, that's what, it, that's, 
they're running it. They said it was running it based on her mind. So the thing is reading her mind to project all these things and run the program. Kind of, but it's also, it's not going to be able, it might not be able to tell if she's willing to be honest with herself until she is honest with herself. Right. You know what well, I mean? And, and that's the thing. Maybe, maybe, I guess you could say they scanned her mind and th- that was the thing she needed to do. That was her mental block. That's why it was book. That's mm-hmm. like may- maybe the test is different, like completely different for every person. This version of the test was f- specifically tailored to her. Like I know it's tailored to her visually and tailored to her with the person who's giving it to her, but. But she's doing that. Well, I don't know about she's doing that. It's No, they said that. They said that because she was like, why, why are we still in the library? Oh, it's because the library is still, is my primary mission. This is the thing that I'm focused on well, right no, now. No, like, no, no. It could it have said, been anything based on. It said that we, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the, the pronouns it used, but it said that this test is projecting this because it's your most important environment. Mm-hmm. That is, that's what it said. It didn't say like she's doing it. I think you're reading it as she's running the program i viewed it as they're running the program and using her mind the the program is being run inside that whatever this projector is that's connected to her and her mind is being used as the materials to create the create the aesthetics Mm -hmm. of the thing but i think what what you are pointing out is that maybe the test itself at least to me you have you've highlighted the fact that the test itself might also be a projection of her internal struggles and maybe it's dealing with like how she can overcome her own biases and internal struggles. And maybe that's, I could see that. I think the test overall is the same. Okay. And that's what I'm pushing back on making sense to me, but the, the labyrinth itself, maybe not. Yeah, no, the, the labyrinth itself is clearly not. The yeah. labyrinth and the and the person and all that is coming from her. Right. Obviously. I'm not I'm not that's that's not a dispute here. What I'm disputing is like, what test do they give everyone? Is it always about the fear that you have? Is it always about admitting your fears? Which is what they they were like, we needed someone who could admit their fears so that they could be a better suited to protect the progenitor technology and all this stuff. Um Someone who yeah. knew themselves. They had to know themselves and be honest with themselves. Right. So that's what I'm saying. So, like, is it that honesty that they're seeking and the test could be completely different? Uh, the thing they need to admit could be completely different. It's not about their fears. It could be about something else completely. Uh, it's just about their, uh, they understand her mind because they've scanned it and can project all this stuff. She mm. just has to be able to make the decision to look at herself honestly. Right. Okay. Sure. I, yeah, I, I guess I still, th- yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess I can get behind that. Especially coming from a betazoid scientist or, or neuroscientist, like the idea that you question yourself, particularly, I think is very important to mm-hmm. being a good person, making the right decisions. Um, so it's not, so, so I guess, I guess, I guess I can get behind it. You've talked me into it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that I talked to you in anything. It sounded like you doing a lot of the talking, man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, you pushed back on me and that gave me, gave, yeah. gave me, gave me time to think about it. I mean, I just watched this episode, but, but my initial reaction to this was it felt a little like so many discovery episodes do where it's like the mission is to work out your own personal stuff, which like, yeah, I'm on board with the mission causing characters to work through their personal stuff. Like, I think that's how a lot of Star Trek episodes and episodes of all shows. I love function, yeah. but so often discovery is like their particular needs and like their particular self fulfillment is built into the mission somehow in a way that like is so on the nose that it is like it, it strains incredulity and makes me a little like, and it's almost always Michael too. So it's like, it's that, it, that's part of it too. Is it's like you set up a mission and in, in most Star Trek shows, you have a cast of characters like on, on the, on the shows that are a little more spread out with which characters they use as the main character of a particular episode. So you can design a mission 
to be need to be fulfilled by any of the characters. Mm -hmm. So whatever the lesson of that mission is, you can align it to a variety of characters. And this show is so focused on Michael that every mission is kind of like exactly what she needs to learn in that moment. And that gets, yeah, that's the thing that it, it, it's the thing that discovery does that bothers me. And it's the thing that this episode was like, the way I was perceiving the episode was like, the test is the exact thing Michael needs in this moment. But in this discussion, and yes, I've, I've talked a lot. I'm seeing it as the thing. The test is you just need to be honest with yourself. And the test is looking at your brain and seeing if you are. Yeah. And so the lesson that she learns about fear and her particular fears is specific to her because it, the test is always specific about honesty. It's not about, yeah, I, I guess, I guess that works. <laughs> yeah. I, is, is, I agree with you. I think that they do that a lot mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's ham fisted and it doesn't work for me in this particular case. I think it worked a lot for me. Well, good. I, 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 I'm glad. And I, I didn't have that initial reaction, but I'm, I'm unwinding it in my head. What I didn't like was, you know, the other ca the other crewmates are like clearly under the wire and they need a solution and Reno has the solution. Oh, that was terrible. That was but she's terrible like, scene. spends like 20 minutes talking about like, oh, I was hanging out with the Hyperians or I'm like, shut up. Yeah. No, she, well, she's <laughs> always been a character that has a broad depth of experience. But last mm -hmm. week they had a conversation about how she had a lot of jobs. And so like they're literally like having that war room discussion about what they need to do. And she goes, you remember that conversation we had about me having a lot of jobs? It's like the. There's uh -huh. no hustle to her talking at all. It really, I'm right there with you. That was the, that pissed me off. <laughs> and, you know, I was, you know, uh, hyperbole, uh, it wasn't 20 minutes, but yeah, it no, was, it was, was like really two long minutes. Time. I mean, it was like two minutes, but it was still like, you are under the wire, seconds matter. <laughs> yeah. And you've all said how much seconds matter. And this like thing is, you know, the, the, the archive is about to be destroyed. And you're like, let me tell you a little life story before I get to yeah. the point of I know how to solve this, you know? And also, let's throw out a few jokes about how you guys say things at the same time, and I love it when you do that. Like, Yeah. That, that was dumb. I, I, uh, yeah, I really... Honestly, I think I was set up to dislike this episode from the <laughs> intro. From the last time on, uh -huh. made me feel like I was watching... Okay, it was a it was a complaint I had last week, and the the last time on highlighted it to no de to like a huge degree, and it made me really annoyed. Um, I liked oh. last week's episode a lot, but the scene with Stamets where he like kept telling people how important the mission was, they used it as the first thing in the intro, and it just cut to him going, <laughs> um, "It is." the most important thing to the Federation is we find the progenitor's technology. And it, that line made me think of every, like, you know, there's, I don't know. There's lots of representations of this, but when like an actor, like you're, you're watching a show about making a sci-fi show and it sort of like makes fun of the sci-fi show. And it mm -hmm. sounds like power Rangers babble speak or whatever. <laughs> that line yeah. made me feel that way. That line made me feel like this is, and it's the, it, it's the line that annoyed me last week, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I, I skipped that. I just skipped. That oh last yeah. Time. It, I was just like, ah, yeah. I know what happened. <laughs> I always watch them. Cause I'm always like some, I might've forgotten something. Cause I often do. Yeah. Also, I don't like it because when the, when they say the last time on discovery, they're basically telling me what they're going to be talking about. And yeah. Like, yeah. And it sometimes reveals what they're going to, what the reveal is going to be. Yeah. And I'm already pretty good at figuring out what they're going to do. So yeah. I don't need that extra push. Yeah, I hear that. Sometimes though, they'll bring back something. It, well, it's, it, that's the that's the struggle. Is it sometimes they'll bring something back from two seasons ago mm -hmm. that will give me a clue as to what's going on, uh, and I need that clue. And other times, it just annoys me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Discovery is also the thing where they're like previously on Star Trek, and then it shows like a clip of the freaking cage. So I don't like. You know, if somebody shows up like 
flocks or somebody, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want them to like cut to a thing of enterprise and I'm like, with a Dr. Flocks doing a thing. And I'm like, what? Right. Yeah. Like why? Yeah. No, I get that. I like, and it's the same struggle for me. It's the struggle of like, will I remember the thing when it gets there? That's supposed to be surprising to me. And like, Hopefully they don't do that extreme of a thing where it's like showing flocks, but you, yeah. know, you, never, you never know. They might. So I, I got annoyed because Reno was like giving her like full spiel about how she worked for the Hyperians and how they really know how to party. And I didn't remember who the hell they were. So I had to pause the episode and look it up. And they're those, uh, those weird like Ren Fair aliens from lower decks who have like dragons and shit. And call their uh, engines like dragon power engines and shit. You know what I'm talking oh, about? No, I don't. Were they only from Lower Decks? Yeah, that's yeah. fun. That's fun that uh, Discovery is referencing Lower Decks that way. And the uh, you, you should remember it's like the engineer didn't. Uh, his mother wanted him to get married or something, and he's part of those people. And it was like a, just a big like they all look like they're in medieval times, but they're on starships and they have dragons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's funny yeah yeah i remembered as soon as i saw the picture and i was like oh them but uh yeah i i by the name i was like uh what yeah yeah i don't i don't it feels like a reference and they did a really stupid thing to get to that reference so it better be worth it <laughs> right and it's, it's a fun reference it's a fun reference um but overall i i I enjoyed the stuff inside the labyrinth of the mind, uh, except for kind of how it resolved, I guess. Yeah. But I'm, but I'm, I'm working around to it. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to concede it was better than I experienced it. I even, I even did find myself on the edge of my seat as like the light started dimming and flickering. Oh, and good. then she was like, wait, what? And then as she was like doing the maze with the sand, every time she would walk out of a section, like it would go dark. And I was mm-hmm. just like, Ooh, that's so ominous. That's actually a pretty good yeah, device. It, it was, it was, um, it reminded me of, uh, silence in the library. This whole episode reminded me a little bit of silence in the library mm. from Dr. Who. Uh, I mean, obviously because it's a library, but also just yeah. like the flickering lights and the, in that it's the shadows coming at you that, that are, they're that causing the trouble, which I, you know, I appreciate it. It was fun. Which by the way, Hey, if you want me to like a show set, most of it in a library that gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It's actually the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto. Mm. And I'm like, can I live there? It's, it was beautiful, man. It really was. And not to mention the indoor interior, but the exterior, or uh, beyond the interior, the exterior when they pulled up and the like vision of it in the Badlands, it, mm-hmm. I was like, man, that is a beautiful archive. Yeah. That is good stuff. Yeah. Speaking of beautiful things in the archive... Um, the the lady, the curator. Yeah, she's gorgeous. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, at. I know she's got all the makeup shit to you know because she's a Frozian, but I was like, man, she's really attractive to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's she's beautiful. Um, she's also uh, I felt like very. I don't know. There was a certain like almost like fairy aesthetic to her uh, it, 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 that we don't get on Star Trek very often. From uh, I don't know, like a like a she's just very affable and very like pleasant, and and she's a, she's a we we don't get many like con- customer service representatives. You know what I mean? Like we don't get <laughs> she's like in in Star Trek because it's like a world without money. You don't have many people that are there to like. Hey, welcome. Come on in. Like she's and it's like, man, she's she's she she played it very well and I liked how funny she was. I really liked the uh uh it, like it almost feels like everything almost every interaction begins as a military interaction, you know, or like mm-hmm. some sort of like hello, welcome, diplomat, diplomat, military, military. And like she was just like, "Hey guys, come on in." Like very inviting. Um yeah. and I really and I I was annoyed at Starfleet the way they treated her speech. Like Maybe it's important that that's what annoys me. They were so, this is like the first contact with this archive in a long time. As far as we know, they show up to the archive. This is an important, important thing. And instead of like listening to her whole spiel, they like decide like, yeah, 
uh, we don't have time for that. But Jet Reno has time for like yeah. a weird. That that's the thing that like that's why that annoyed me so much in the Jet Reno situation is it's like they might have had really important. You're about to travel through the Badlands, and yeah, they're sending the coordinates on whatever. But then you had communication difficulties during and couldn't she couldn't hear her what she was saying to do. So like maybe you should have listened to the whole speech. You know, it's frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I get where they're coming from, and they were at least nice to her. Just kind of. I mean, they were nicer than the Breen, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> low bar, Dave. Low bar is all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, now, the uh, the woman who played, uh, I can't remember her name now. I, her timing was really, really on point, and yeah. I just really enjoyed her character. And... Uh, also, I'm just happy to see another Afrosian. We haven't seen those guys since, like, Star Trek VI. Oh, wow. Kurtwood Smith played the uh, Federation president. Okay, I was going to say, that was that's where, he, where we saw them before, right? And the only other time we saw them, I think, was in Star Trek IV. I remember seeing it as a child and it confusing me because he looked enough like a Klingon to me yeah. with the head ridges that I was like, wait, the whole thing is the Klingons... Like trying to make peace with the Federation, but why is a Klingon on the Federation like leading the Federation side? Like, <laughs> to, yeah, like they don't explain it, but he looks a lot like they just. It was a weird choice. It was a weird choice yeah. for a, for as a kid to be watching and be like, "Isn't that a Klingon?" <laughs> By the way, guess guess who named them the Afrosians? I don't know who. An associate producer on Star Trek IV, Kirk Thatcher. I don't know who that is. You do. Well, I'm saying he's, I don't know the name. He's he's the punk on the bus. Oh, funny. That's funny. He also wrote the song that yeah. he was listening to. I knew that. I knew that and part. I think performed it. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. He's, it's just it's really funny to me that he was the guy who was like, yeah. a frozen. Such a such a weird thing. Like I, he was a he was a producer, would you say? Uh, an associate producer on associate Star Trek producer. 4. It's just it's just interesting, like when you're naming things and having these like it's interesting that that it was that collaborative that the associate producers like can I name an alien race? <laughs> uh, and he did name uh, name them in honor of the production manor, uh, manager Mel Efros. Oh, okay, neat. But yeah, I, I yeah I had to look that up and it was like because I only remembered them from four and six. I was like, were they anywhere else? Yeah. Hmm. But then that that little tidbit came out, and I was like, "Holy shit! It's Kirk Thatcher." Mm-hmm. That's really weird. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a really strange, like, very specific, uh, like Star Trek history. It was like, yeah. But that guy pops up in my life sometimes. Like, my wife was uh, binge watching all of Dinosaurs, like that old show on from the nineties with the mm-hmm. giant. Uh, uh, what were they? Um, Jim Henson dinosaurs, and he was a producer on that show. And I was like, Kirk Thatcher, is that the same <laughs> Kirk Thatcher? And it totally was. That's really that's really weird and funny. What did you think of the other storyline? Uh, in this episode, the, the kind of main thing with the Breen. Um, I was okay with it. I kind of feel like um, that one Breen dude, the the main guy that uh that Maul was appealing to who wound up uh, joining her yeah, and convincing everybody else. I kind of feel like I did like, cause they all look the same. I was like, I'm having a little trouble following who she's mm-hmm. talking to. Is she, is this a, an important character? Mm-hmm. And then it, it turned out he was, but I, you know, I don't know. I, and I still think that uh, the main Breen bad guy rune i think his name was something like that um the the priarch whatever the primark primark yeah yeah, primark he he's just a little mustache twirly for me but he was obviously just very like concerned with with his own power and his own uh self-interest that he would go against the the oath the blood oath or whatever the hell they called it um (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah, like he's even mustache twirly for his own society. You know, like yeah. it's, it's not like it's just a cultural divide. He's like, 
doing the bad and then he's not caring about his own cultures like specific things that they're supposed to care about <laughs> yeah and it's i will say is it's tough to get a read on this kind of stuff when all the bad guys are wearing the helmets uh-huh but they did a good enough job of when he was like now destroy the the place and they all they all kind of had like a little movement where they all kind of yeah. like went back a little bit and i was like that's actually pretty good. I wouldn't have known that they were like questioning <laughs> what he's saying to do because <laughs> you can't see their damn faces. Yeah, I actually uh, disagree uh, with you on it being tough. Like, I think they did a really. I mentioned it last week that when when they were in negotiations, um, I thought it was. Uh, I, I thought they did a really good job of displaying like what the bringing were thinking, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. the movements and I thought they did a really good job this episode too now it was like I was just having to assume this was an assumption but it was right I think that like the the guy standing to her right they basically it's it's funny but like they basically had to block the scene where like the Breen stood in the same place for their entire interactions through the episode the Primark is here Maul is here, and the guy standing to her immediate right <laughs> is the one you're supposed to be following as the sort of main dissenter, right? Like, uh-huh. he, it's like he's, oh, he's clearly has empathy for her. Like, you can see by the way he turned his head when the Primarch said that. They did a really good job of it, so I'm not yeah. complaining, but it is sort of hilarious that they were like, if they had shuffled the guys around at all, or ever had him leave her side, I would have been like, I don't know who's who at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little bit rushed, on on her her ascendancy like to power her, yeah her ascendance <laughs> to power yeah uh, a little i bit. expected more of a fight from primark honestly mm-hmm. like i ain't know she was just gonna like kick him and be done with it and take him out yeah but uh i get it you got two more episodes in the season you gotta yeah. hurry it along i guess but you know who it was not a rush to ascendancy to power and i loved so much commander reese he had like a minute of captaining and he just like killed it like i loved i loved him as 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 you know in the captain's chair and like given his orders and just like very different than the way burnham uh deals with the crew very different than the way that uh uh, rayner deals with the crew he stepped in and was just like yeah go into the badlands prepare this prepare that go there and they're like and, and they're like but what and he's like yeah we'll, we'll lose our senses but so will they go like he's like he just had the decision made like he assessed the situation and immediately made the call no discussion like, <laughs> like i don't know and i understand i don't know i just i just enjoy that like he has a totally different captaining style and it was one that i'm much more familiar with you know with like kind of leading leading mm-hmm. the crew like uh, Kirk or, or Picard would do. There's a time for taking in and more information. There's a time to make a decision, and he needed to make a decision that moment. He did it. It wasn't a lot of like, how does everyone feel about this decision before I make it? Because we're in too big of a hurry, Janet Reno. Yeah. <laughs> Her name is Jet Reno, by the way. Damn it. Janet Reno's the freaking <laughs> Bill Clinton's <laughs> whatever. Golly. <laughs> What, what was she, Secretary of State or something? I don't remember what, what Janet Reno uh, actually did in real life. I just remember Will Ferrell as being, Janet Reno. J- doing Janet Reno. Attorney like, You General. fight dirty, then how come my conscience is so clean? Yep, that's I remember that too. Damn it. I, I think like this is the second week I've gotten Jet Reno completely confused. Uh, <laughs> last week it was confusing her with... Uh, that other character from uh, Strange New Worlds, and now I'm confused to her with Attorney General Je- <laughs> Janet Reno. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, and I just have a vision of quote unquote Janet Reno <laughs> kicking uh, Rudolph Giuliani in the balls. Yep, on Saturday Night Live. So <laughs> it's good. It's we're good, good sketch <laughs> together we're worth a, a little less than a damn yeah i think <laughs> yeah a little less <laughs> yeah I, overall i really did enjoy the breen stuff and like uh the primarchs like playing politics trying to like 
ingratiate the crew to her him by uh dealing with Maul in a very like positive way, but then you know, not willing to go too far. And she, he says, speak to my soldiers again, and I will eviscerate you in front of them. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't stop her. She, she now, still does it. Yeah. I liked that. I mean, I didn't think that Maul's points were weak. Mm-hmm. She saw that they were clearly like, wait, what? When he was given these bogus orders. Uh huh. And she was making some fine points about like, dude, if you destroy the archive, all the other brain are going to be like, look at how dishonorable this prick is and he's like it will not matter we will not worry we will have the power yeah yeah like damn dude you're just like fucking skeletor right now do Mm -hmm. you realize (laughs) yeah yeah. it is it was very skeletor-esque the voice as well um and also very convenient like you know we never can't understand the brain uh through the universal translator or whatever so very convenient that he was like we will speak her tongue to honor her and it's like that's just so the show could be in english <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, another annoyance with the michael burnham storyline uh oh, when he's man. like i know i know but he says that <laughs> we get so much hate mail about this she says something to the fake book and says that you won't fail again. And he says, again. And she says, screw you. I'll find my own way out. And runs away from the, like, omnipresent program that's trying to help her. Like, it just yeah. <laughs> it felt, like, super. That was weird. It was weird. And she comes back. But it's like, I'm sorry. That is just that type of emotional outburst, like, is over the line for like people in everyday life dealing with each other. Like I understand everything. I need a minute to think this through, but like I'm bailing on this relationship. You program. <laughs> it just, it just felt way over the top for me. Um, and then comes back. It's like, I'm sorry. That was an outburst. Like, yeah, you're, you're trying to solve the riddle of this thing. I don't know. It just didn't. Yeah. It was, it was weird, man. I, it was I, it was weird and but to to people who will argue for it and I would be annoyed and have been annoyed when any other captain has done that kind of shit. Oh, 100%. I'm not saying that like Burnham is particularly bad. I just don't like the way they handled the storyline this week, but like and I mean I the way I would argue for it if I'm going to argue for it cuz I can argue against myself, of course, uh is that like Maybe the program was programmed to push her buttons to the point that she would have to like deal with herself. And that's what the point of the program was for her to get to be honest with herself. Um, so like maybe that outburst was essential, which I can understand if she was, if she was like confused about where she was, but the lack of sort of like her, it doesn't align with the situation she's in. She's like in a like universe stakes situation dealing with a piece of software and she gets angry at the software and it just to the point that she won't deal with it anymore. And it's the interface she has to use to solve the puzzle. <laughs> it's just like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. It, that was, yeah. I understand how fraught it is to criticize Michael Burnham for being Michael Burnham. But like sometimes she does shit that's just over the line, silly. Yeah. Now I did. I did think it was funny when when she was like, "Why didn't you tell me I was on the wrong path?" And he's like, "You didn't ask." Yeah. She's like, okay, I'm gonna need you to be more proactive here. <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoyed all of that, man. I loved uh, when she comes in and she's just like, "Um, oh, I see. This is a software. Uh, or you're not the real book." And he's like, "Nope." Like, it's not like <laughs> trying to deceive her. You know what I mean? I really enjoyed that. And uh, she says, um, so I've got to break down the clues, do the thing, blah, blah, blah. She like lays out, I know how this Star Trek episode works. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> the shit that uh-huh. he's like, sounds like you got the hang of it. <laughs> 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 I really enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. And he did a great job of, of- pulling double duty here like oh he for sure did not act, he did not act like book no no not at all totally different character but when he was acting like book in this episode that that actor um 
killed it with the world root scene. Yes. That David Hajala, by the way. David Hajala. Yes. Absolutely killed it. I love the idea. I mean, just the idea of the world root and being in his possession and what that probably means for his character. And like, I assume it's probably going to mean he's looking for like kind of like a new Quajon, you know, um, like rebuild his society or something. Like, I, it just seemed really, really cool for him to have that opportunity. And the line where they're like, our sacred duty is to, we have a sacred duty to lost cultures that they're never forgotten. And he has the most genuine just like breakdown and says, thank you. <laughs> Cause he's like, yeah, you very rarely get like the idea of a lost culture being never forgotten by an archive. You don't normally get a like human response to that from a person that is still a recipient of that. Never forgetting, you know, it was mm-hmm. really, really sweet. I love that moment. How much you want to bet they're going to use those carvings from the uh, the world root or whatever the hell in the final episode? Yeah, with the progenitor's technology to recreate the Quajon. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's going to be that. It, I, I could see that immediately when you say it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's why they're looking for the progenitor's technology. That's why this whole season is building up to them saving, like, recreating Quajon. But another option is just him finding a homeworld for the Quajon and, like, calling all Quajon to a new homeworld. You know, like, the, the, the remnant of Quajon who survived come here, we will rebuild our society. That's sort of a thing. Yeah. Like, that's, that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, somehow all the people who died on the Quajon originally come back somehow to life. come back. Yeah, that would be ridiculous. And, well, the thing is, here's the thing. That is ridiculous. But the sci-fi fan in me <laughs> <laughs> can headcanon. What if the world... They, they connect telepathically to things right like to beings Uh what if their world tree which i think they've even shown them connecting to it in the previous seasons i I, I, I seem to remember them like being connected to the world tree or something what if they like empath or telepath i thought it was empath they're empaths but that's a form of telepathy i don't know anyway i can totally see them being like Yes, this clipping of the world tree contains all the citizens of Quasia. You know what I mean? Like the, because the, they're all linked. They're all the linked to and... this 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 little like we we found a we found a backup hard drive for Quasia, <laughs> and all of the all of the beings on it. And now we're gonna restart Quasia with the progenitor's technology, and it's gonna literally replace all of the people lost. I think that's stupid, and I would I would hate it. But like. I could totally see them writing it out, writing it out that way. Yeah, and I will hate it when they do it. <laughs> I will think it's real dumb. At least this time, when we're writing something that we could totally see happening, we're hoping it doesn't happen. <laughs> oh my god, I just don't want it to happen so hard. I love he just he he has that great aesthetic of like the last of his kind, you know, like he's the last remnant of his you know world. I think that's such a it's a it's a great addition to his character it's sad yeah. it's a bummer i don't like it for him but for us as an audience it's important to have those stakes and have that loss remain part of his character plus he dresses like christopher eccleston and doctor who he so. does he does and that makes me think of him as doctor who all the and his just little ship <laughs> that's like you know it's 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 more uh rubik's QB on the inside or whatever mm-hmm <laughs> <laughs> Or it's more Rubik's Cube on the outside, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that really seems to change on the inside. By the way, they um did you catch that they said that um Michael had a nucleonic beam going into her head? No. I mean I remember That's, that scene when they discussed it, but I don't remember. What's That's the, the same kind of beam that they that the Catan probe hit Picard with in the inner light. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Yeah, I kept I kept think, I kept looking for a uh, Alamarank Easter egg or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Move along home. Yeah, like oh. I could totally see that. Like there, because she's just you know in another little thing she has to solve. It's like I said at the beginning of the episode, she explains what kind of Star Trek episode she's getting into. Um, uh-huh. And and I was I was kind of thinking maybe they'll do some sort of like like sound cue in the background or something. Da, yeah. da, da. 
Da, da, da. <laughs> I, I, you know, so many people hate that episode, and I actually kind of like it a lot. Yeah, well, it's at least memorable. You know, like, there's yeah. a lot of episodes of DS9, and, like, some are good, some are all right, and some are bad, and, like, some are just forgettable and I'd rather something be weird in a funny and interesting way than, I mean, it's like we talk about like even something like Spock's brain or whatever, like that yeah. episode is, is dumb. Yeah. yeah. Like Spock loses his brain. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. It's silly. And like, yeah. you remember that episode. Um, it's yeah. childish and silly, but it's, it's fun to watch. Yeah, people shit on Spock's brain. Like I say, it's like the worst episode. I'm like, it's not Cat's Paw. It's not mm-hmm. like, you know, the Halloween-themed episode, for Christ's sake. Come on. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, let's see. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Any other, any other thoughts about this episode before we move on? I got a few things, but I don't know. Go for it. I might not um, know. I might. Oh. I don't have anything right now. But if I hear you say something, I might go. Oh, I got something on that. Asha's brand new, right? Who is Asha this season? She's the new helmsman that they brought in. Yeah, just uh, yeah. I know you're talking about. Yeah, she. Uh, there's like Jemison and Asha, and they replaced the uh, uh, Detmer and uh, Owo who went to take the Enterprise. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I like I've been just seeing like a lot of sort of like hero shots of Asha. Like they keep cutting to Asha doing things, which is just the normal helmsman shots. Yeah. But like it feels like they're trying to introduce a new character, uh, and like let us know she's there. They keep saying her name, uh, which is like fine. She hasn't done anything, so I don't know who she is as a character. But it's sort of that discovery thing of like, here's a new character, here's a new character care about them um I, I wanted her to be able to have some conversation or something that'll make me like understand who she is if they're going to try to do something with her i guess yeah. um but uh you know i i have no opinion on asha except there's they seem to be letting us know she's there uh-huh. <laughs> they, they keep showing her they keep saying her name um and i'm like who is asha and why like w- is this going somewhere or is this just a replacement for helmsman and like because there's lot, there's lots of helms we get over the years in Star Trek, and like people who work at the stations who they never name. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I feel like Asha, they just keep naming her and keep pointing her out. I want there to be a scene at the very end. I want the season to end on a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. Where Asha is talking to Michael, and Michael looks at her and says, "You remind me of someone," and she says. My name is Asha Tyler. (laughs) And she's like, Ash? And then, like, that's it. Yeah. Like, we don't know how. He went through another genetic restructuring. (laughs) (laughs) And somehow left a thousand years in the future. Yeah, exactly. It's Section 31, man. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I just... That's just funny. (laughs) Silly. Oh, man. I really like... The uh, the line like books the the fake book is doing all the stuff uh, in in that little world and he says uh, <laughs> I promise Tilly would or no, he says Tilly would have been just as frustrating for what it's worth <laughs> like, yeah. if if we if this program had chosen Tilly as your representative she would have also been very frustrating <laughs> I agree <laughs> if not more uh, yeah no I think. Uh, that actor played that role really well. I really enjoyed his his whole affect this episode. Mm-hmm. I kind of thought the um that that program of the guide was really the um like the mental representation of the the scientist. Right. What was totally? Yeah. I mean, Marina. It, they said it, it's a program that she programmed to to leave behind for them so so yeah it's definitely like the conduit to speak to the scientist um mm-hmm. so um i also really liked the the moment where she breaks down a bunch of her own problems like things she does wrong like trying to just plead with this program to like what is it you want to know and she says all these flaws about herself and all these problems she has and then <laughs> the program says some of those things may be true it is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I loved that. I liked it a lot. 
Um, I oh, going back to the character of the, uh, the archivist, I really liked the really silly, cute line about how fun, how fun to have a book visit me in the library for a change. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was cute. You know who she reminded me of? Who's that? Uh, there's a character in Parks and Rec who is an accountant, and um, Adam Scott's character keeps like getting the job and going in there to work for them and deciding he doesn't want to anymore, like almost immediately. Mm-hmm. But there's just like the guy who runs the accounting firm just like really loves Adam Scott's character's um, bad accounting puns. <laughs> and he's just like, Fred, you've got to hear this. He's got another singer. You know, he's just like so happy about it. Um, <laughs> That's a great. That's show. who she reminded me of. Is that's funny? I don't know. She's just very, very affable character. I, I liked her. A yeah. Lot. Also, love was she like came back. She was like the conversation with the brain did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> One thing she said that bothered me a little bit is not about her. She's perfect. She's a perfect angel. Uh, yes. <laughs> but um. I'm working on a on a life size cardboard cutout right now. <laughs> um, man, your wife is out of town. <laughs> it's not about that, Matt. Don't don't sully my affection. <laughs> um, one thing that didn't make any sense to me: they talked about the Betazoid scientist Marina, and like they say. What do you know about her? And then she comes back with only the basics, right? Like, we don't know anything more than you do. She just lived out her entire life yeah. here at the archive. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that how do weird. you know nothing about her? Like, I understand maybe she didn't want them to know much about yeah. her. But if you live out your entire life somewhere, we have learned nothing from Star Trek except if you live your life on a ship with people... Even if you want to avoid getting to know them, you're going to get to know them over time. And it's like, yeah, it just seemed like, like, it, like it'd be one thing if like we knew nothing of her. She showed up here, delivered this, and left. You know, like that would have been an easier answer. But like, we know nothing about her. She just lived here for all of her days. <laughs> yeah, it was a little weird, but I thought about it, and I was like, okay, first of all, let's look at the like the huge list of books that they show that she that she referenced and checked uh-huh. out yeah so she was a bookworm she stayed to herself um but also she's guarding one of the most important secrets in the universe 100 percent. because maybe she kept to herself yeah no and i think that that's the thing she may have kept herself she may have been guarding the secret i think there's there's lots of legitimacy to that but like it just seems like you would know things about her. And they do. They know what che- books she checked out. And Rainer points that out later. Like, w- give me more information. And you know what, she, what books she checked out and you know this, that. Like, he's like, people she talked to, any information. But, like, her saying, like, we don't know anything, like, was just kind of like, I, I thought from the beginning, like, well, she lived here a long time. It, it would have been made more sense to just say, like, she lived here a long time, kind of kept to herself. We do know the kind of stuff she read. We know this. Like, you do know things about her. You're the archive. Like you're the person like guarding information yeah. about all the society and civilization. She's an important element and you just like, I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. It feels like uh be a little more proactive, you know? Yeah, but you know what? Like that's the kind of line. On his face it seems a little weird. But also, that's the kind of line that will make somebody like freaking Greg Cox write an entire novel about her life. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, speaking of I, the archive in general, I also wanted to like, I wanted to see them defend themselves. Yeah. Um, because being who they are and what they are, it just seemed like they're so confident in their ability to archive everything. And I know mm-hmm. in the end, Discovery had to protect them. But I kind of want, like, when they say, we're here to serve everyone as long as they follow the rules, I was expecting some, like, godlike defenses. Yeah, me too. And then they had a shield that seemed very penetrable and seemed like they got pretty hurt and could have been destroyed, you know, yeah. by one brain ship. It just, I mean, I know that they're protected sort of by the social contract of it all, but it seems like there would be more than that. It seems like they would but, have yeah. physical protections. 
dealing with all of those warring races and everything, you would think they would just be armed to the teeth. Like, and that's what I, I did kind of want to see that. I wanted to see like all of a sudden panels flipping open and guns coming out and all sorts of shit. And I wanted, uh, uh, Harrell to be like, nobody messes with the Kive, you yeah. know, like <laughs> <laughs> the Kive. Oh man. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what i wanted to like I, I thought that was what we were heading towards with her like honestly it was it was the character character archetype that made me feel that way because she's so she's so friendly and affable but also has such an important role for the societies yeah. and so much like we know that the thing she's guarding specifically for this purpose is so important and they've got yeah. a huge and the world tree is so important. Like they've got a huge archive and the two things we see are like, uh, like society sustaining root and a like possible universe ending clue to technology. Like, it just feels like they've got they're an archive full of stuff like that, right? <laughs> as far yeah. as we can tell. And then they're like I you know, the social contract keeps us safe. Like I like I don't know about that, yeah. guys. I don't know. You need to have like you need more protection than that. Yeah. I thought they needed stronger shields just to get through the badlands, honestly. Right. They're in the bad I mean that that is part of their protection is the badlands, but they seem to have somehow mapped out the badlands. Like they can, mm. they can not only know that they're safe in it, but they know how to guide others through it. Yeah, they even got like a pretty blue, uh, blue land inside of the badlands. Yeah, they got a little blue, blue, blue place. Yeah. All right. Uh, do we have any feedback today? We do. Yeah. Get, let's let's hit it. All right. Um, I think this may be for last week. But Andre Sparks sent us uh, sent us an email hey, Andre. called Enter the Breen. It says, hey, guys, I have to say that this is probably my favorite episode since the first two of the season. I like the intensity and pace. I definitely feel like Renner, Rainer has a purpose now. I feel his heart break when talking about his planet. Uh, Breen seemed to really be a threat. I haven't really felt a threat like that in this show in a long time. Mm -hmm. I also enjoyed seeing Book use his powers. Locke sacrificing himself for Maul was powerful. With three episodes left, we are definitely in the end game now. Do you think uh, Maul is pregnant and will now become the new Breen Queen, or is she just trying to reanimate Locke? Keep up the good work. P.S. I hope to meet Anson Mount at my Tidewater Comic Con. I'll let you know if I do. Mm. Um, <clears throat> oh, do you know that? Yeah. Uh, speaking of cons, do you know that Brent Spiner and John Delancey are coming to town? For the oh yeah Birmingham yeah. Comic Con, they're calling it, but it's not. Con it's not like it's Comic Con instead of Comic Con. I don't know. It's definitely like a uh, whatever, probably yeah d uh, infringement of some sort. But uh, <laughs> I uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I thought about trying to go. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I saw a uh, my wife pointed out a flyer to me, mm -hmm. and I went oh, okay. And honestly, just didn't think about it until you just said something. Yeah, I, I, you th it's in July, <laughs> I think. Um, anyway, but I'm not a convention guy. I don't want to stand in a line. I don't want to. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I enjoy a convention, and the ones that are local like that. Sometimes there's like almost no one there, so you don't have that. Mm. Uh, like I've been to a few where they had some minor celebrities. Like I don't know, those are pretty big uh, Star Trek guys. So like. I feel like maybe they'll get a crowd for that, but like a lot of the ones I've gone to here in Birmingham have had like no lines for things because it's just like mm. not as not as big of a town to do that stuff in. So yeah, I wonder how much they're charging. I don't know. Just check it out. Um, yeah, maybe at least, so. at least look into it. I don't. I don't think Mal, Mal is or Mal is pregnant. By the way. Uh yeah, I don't. I don't know. That would be. I don't think she needs to be for the story, for sure. Um, that she has already used her connection to Locke to like make this happen and she's I mean, yeah. but he's he's talking about from last week's perspective possibly so we, we mm -hmm. uh and, and 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 he says is she looking to be the new brain queen i think like to some degree she already has done that as of this week like she's in she's in some form of control of the brain right now or at least that faction um mm -hmm. you know so that's uh so that's definitely definitely the case by the way uh andre i would be wary of getting your hopes up to meet anson mount I don't, he might actually cancel. He has recently gotten into some hot water over statements about Israel and Palestine. So 
Uh, I don't know. Mm. Things he might want to lay low for a minute. I wouldn't be surprised if he <laughs> if he canceled. I hadn't heard about that yet. Yeah, they're they're saying he's a Zionist, and uh, things are are not looking good. Gotcha. On the cancel train. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, obviously. I, I I I don't know anything about his statements. Have to look into it all to see how I feel about them. But yeah. Um. Um. I did not agree with him. I will just okay. say that. Yeah. Uh, I. <laughs> I am definitely uh, not in agreements with most, uh, like, <laughs> gr- growing up, the idea of being a Zionist was, was, was not such a bad thing, you just, if you just care that Israel exists, but what they're doing now and supporting them fully is a different thing. And so it's just like, right. yeah, like depending on his statements, like, so, so just, it, it's, it's, it's just disturbing, especially like, I mean, obviously this is the whole argument is just like a bunch of people just saying like, if you say anything against Israel, you're a anti-Semite, which is obviously mm-hmm. bullshit. Um, <laughs> but also saying that you care that Israel exists is also not necessarily a terrible thing, but, but saying that they have a right to do what they're doing now is pretty, uh, is pretty right. un- inexcusable. So yeah, again, I, I, I don't want to go to. I just don't want to jump on the cancel train until I hear read about it. But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, what what I saw was like the, he seemingly was discounting the the Palestinian claim that uh, fifteen thousand children had been killed. Right. Because he was like, "Well, yeah, of course they would say that or something." Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, I wasn't down with with his take on it and. Yeah, that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty terrible. It's just, uh, I literally. mean, uh, you know, like quibbling over the exact numbers aside, like a lot of people, including children, are being killed in Palestine right now. Yeah. So, like, uh, the idea of just like trying to push it aside in any direction is is pretty, uh, pretty terrible. Yeah, and I didn't go a lot deeper because it just bummed me out. No one. Yeah, to that really bums me out because I, I mean, and, 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 like, like I said, I, I think. Almost anyone of the older generation uh, grew up with this very, like, American ideal that, like, Israel is our closest ally in the region and, like, all this stuff about... I Mm -hmm. I grew up with the same stuff and, like, we're just seeing it a little differently now. You know what I mean? Like, in this this world and, like, uh, it's tough because uh, a lot of people who are just, like, of a different time. But that's the whole thing about Star Trek. And, like, I, I built a lot of my uh ethics through watching this show and and a lot of like what you do is you look at the situation and you say oh yeah that's our ally that's our enemy but oh look our ally is doing something we don't agree with we have to stand up for our values mm-hmm. and so like you know you you like like just you you may care greatly for the uh state of Israel and the Jewish people and but like you the way you care greatly for someone is not to follow them blindly and that's right. that's like one of the main lessons of Star Trek. I feel, yeah. And and in this episode, even like being willing to like fully excavate yourself and question your own biases and uh, yeah. So, it, but it's tough because I know there's a lot of people out there who haven't questioned those those things, and they're just yeah. they're relying on the previous priors that they used to believe, and like people that are listening to us right now, there are probably people that are turning this off because they hear people that are just criticizing of criticizing israel so they're they're anti-semitic you know what i mean and like yeah it's just not the way the world works there are uh, my my my, the the day on october 7th uh when when the attacks happened um Mm -hmm. my uh, my uh friend who who's of uh who who is of jewish descent um he's not practicing but he's he's jewish uh by you know uh, nationality um mm-hmm. and and some someone oh, another one was like I don't know what's going on over there I don't know anything about Israel and Palestine like I don't know who's good and who's bad and like what's going on and they're like yeah it's just bad guys on both sides like the 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 stuff that happened on October seventh is terrible the response is terrible like it's go like yeah you, <laughs> it's it's the it's basically just violent extremists on both sides are causing violence and. 
instead of like seeking peace on e- from either of the leadership of either side. Um, and so the people aren't bad on either side. So there's good people like fighting for rights on both sides and there's terrible people like un- unfortunately often in charge pushing for violence and yeah, it's, it's, it's rough. It's rough. So I, so I, I just wanted, I wanted to like, I guess flush it out because I feel like just cut touching on it slightly is, is a recipe for misunderstanding. So that's yeah, where I, I stand. mean, you know, there's not a lot of Palestine left and I know, we're, you know, America's given a lot of their firepower to, to Israel mm-hmm. and, uh, it's a lot of colonization going on. It's, yep. And the, the it's pretty shitty. The really overall. terrible, some of those terrible stuff is like them talking about like the West Bank or whatever. And like, uh, do you hear those statements of like Jared Kushner, like Trump's son in law, mm-hmm. said something about how, or maybe the, I did, no. how valuable the property is? Oh, Christ. Yeah. It's that based. Like, just like it's beachfront property. Like, <laughs> it's really valuable. Oh, Jesus. It's Christ, like, what no. the hell? Like, literally, just like, well, we might as well take more beachfront property and like, it'd be a great tourist destination for other people. Let's get these other people Ugh. out of there. It's like, dude, people live there. Um, I don't know. And, and, I, and I, you know, I, there's, it's a very complicated history. There have been terrible things done on both sides, but the one committing the genocide currently <laughs> is the one that we have to stand up to and stop giving, yeah. we- at least stop giving weapons to like, just, just that's the, that's the start of it. Start of standing yep. up to this. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to move on to Stu's? Sure. I'm, I'm, let's say, let's, uh, that, that was an answer to Andre's questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, don't get your hopes up for Anson Mount to show up. Yeah, but you brought it up, man. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Stu sends us an email titled, Alamorain Count to Snore. (laughs) So I guess we can can guess what what he's going to be. Yeah. He's going to be feeling about this one. (laughs) Um. Stu says, Labyrinth of the Mind, at least the Breen can find peace in the knowledge that Locke's quote-unquote murderer has died with him. Is Terrell supposed to be a Klingon librarian? People who don't return their books on time have no honor. (laughs) No, she is not. She is not Klingon. A Frozian. Yep. But I thought thought that too. Yeah. Star Trek 6. Star Trek 4 and 6. But Kurtwood Smith... Played a, a very prominent Afrosian as president of the Federation. In six, right? Yeah, in yeah. six. Uh, the Labyrinth of the Mind is basically if a Wadi from DS9 was more into therapy sessions than games. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. What about the therapists who use games? Indeed. And there was a maze. Eh, it wasn't a maze. That's a game. It's an escape room of the mind. It, it was not. It was a therapy <laughs> session. For sure. It was. <laughs> uh, Stu says, I don't want to sound demanding, but imagine if the guy had taken the form of Spock instead of Book. But why? <laughs> why, Stu? <laughs> that shit never occurred to me. It always made sense that it was Book. Why would it be Spock? <laughs> <laughs> Like, Book is clearly the relationship that she's having an issue with right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, she does have... She has her issues with Spock as well. Um, but I do think that... Like, like I could see her... Spock appearing to her as a representation of all of her fears of not living up and stuff, you know? Mm. Um, so, so I, I could see it. I could see that. That would be cool. It would be fun. Yeah. It would be a fun visit and a, and a way to have that char- that actor visit without it actually like being a connection or whatever. Yes, but I will argue that she resolved her issues with Spock in season two. Their relationship had closure. The book relationship does not have closure. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, it's just a matter of what closure you're trying to get, and like they wrote it in such a way that it makes sense to its book. Yeah, but I I see where Stu's coming from. That would have been a fun thing to do and a cool crossover while it would have made sense. It it could Mm. have made sense if they'd written it differently, but they chose this way. And the actor who plays Book, what's his name again? Uh, David Ajala. David Ajala. In Star Trek, we have a name. Uh, Sorry, 
uh <laughs> bike bike club reference i don't know uh anyway uh <laughs> the David Ajala did such a good job in this episode that I, I like, yeah, it would have been nice to see Ethan Peck show up for a cameo for whatever reason. Um, but like, I really liked his performance here. and I don't think we should take it away from, yeah. from him. He's, it was great. Yeah. I love that guy. Like I, I saw, Me I too. was introduced to him on uh Supergirl on the CW. Oh, interesting. He elevated the shit out of that show. Like, <laughs> he played this guy named Manchester black uh, he just did a fantastic job, and I love to see him every time he was on screen. Cool. Um, Sue says, "Holy shit! They gave Reese acting command and let him actually do stuff." Yes, yeah. it's glorious, dude. It was awesome. It was one minute on screen, but man, it was cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was very short, but I loved it. Stu continues, "Is the test that she has to give up on passing the test, and therefore the clue to show." She's willing to give up getting the progenitor tech and in turn prove she's worthy of having it because I've been thinking for a lot of this season, them trying to get the clues is far less effective than just destroying the ones they have. So no one can get the tech, mm. you know, the standard, those who don't seek power are the only ones who, w- who should wield it type deal. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I dig that. Uh, I don't because even while there's a mission at hand to get the the power, they're still explorers, and mm-hmm. it would seem antithetical to Starfleet to just be like, "Nope, we're gonna destroy it so nobody can get it, and we can't find out where the hell we came from." Yeah, I you know? I, I agree with that. I do think that there's like a there's a different test he's got in mind, and I think like that's a that's a cool idea. But I, I I fall on your side. I, I think that like you don't want, uh, yeah, you don't want to st- destroy the scientific exploration of this. Hmm. Uh, quote gelatinous assholes. <laughs> I dare you to say th- say that to Murph from Prodigy, Rainer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Actually, Ooh, that's a good point. Is, what is, is what if Murph? Breen? What if Murph's a Breen? Eh, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Because they're gelatinous in their freezer form, right? <laughs> well, yeah, but like the, I think the refrigeration suits are to keep them solid enough to to operate. No, no, no. That's the opposite, right? I don't know because Locke no. Locke was out of his suit and he was solid. Right. Right, but he became something else. Like, they might, like, Im- clearly, like, their refrigerated jelly form is what they consider to be, like, evolved. Mm hmm. And if you're outside of the refrigeration suit, I guess the jelly turns to a solid form. Right. So. Oh, God. I don't know. So yeah, like yeah, may, it can't it, be a brain. It, it, well, it could be if like they're born in jelly form and they solidify over time, and maybe their refrigeration suits are like keeping them youthful or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But we're we're just trying to make it work. But like, that, yeah, it's, I'm a, it's, to make it it's work. a fun theory. Yeah, I need pen and paper. I can't just do it in my head. <laughs> I've got to like map out uh, the logic. <laughs> I'm dumb. I can't do it. It's all right, Dave. We're we're both dumb. Um, Stu says I do not find the conclusion to this test satisfying. This was just a convoluted pep talk solution. I don't think I have to explain that I disagree. Yeah, I think we've had this conversation throughout, and like, I am. You made me feel better about it, but I. I, I, I felt the same way Stu did after I watched the episode. Stu says, I'm not impressed with how easily Rune was played. He needed to read the evil overlord list or how quickly his soldiers turned against him. Bunch of simps. Uh, I think I think there is uh, enough <laughs> of him uh, acting a bit sus throughout the season mm-hmm. and them kind of being like, what? To like justify them. And even, you know, they wait until that other dude turned yeah well she also they also waited it, 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 she only really convinced one and then that was enough to convince the others mm-hmm. but also like 
she is like I think now that we know he's the scion, right? Like now that we know he's this like representation of their empire, right? Uh, and they believe in bloodline like succession. Now we know that like sh- he left the ship for this person mm-hmm. for Maul. And so they are probably really curious about Maul and who she is and why he would do that. You know what I mean? Like, no Breen leaves. We've never seen them out of their suits. You know, like, Breen don't leave the Empire. Mm -hmm. And this one left to go be with this person. What does she have? And then they see her in front of all of them arguing for the the more Breen way of handling this. Yeah. Uh, and, And then she baits the Primarch into making that blood oath. And then he immediately is okay breaking it. You know what I mean? Like it's a, uh, it, yeah. It, it was it was definitely a uh, like combination of I think all of them being like interested in her, like in like what this what what is this character? Why would he? Why would the scion leave for this woman? And also then she proves herself in in the arguments she makes, and the Primarch is proving himself to not care about them or his own honor. And like, I I think it was well played. Yeah. Like by the writers, I guess. Yeah. Stu says, okay. So an interesting episode in theory diminished a bit by execution and an overcommitment to theme over plot, a mindscape constructed labyrinth puzzle thing could have been a lot more interesting and exciting than Michael's self-reflection with a smugger version of book and robes. While I find the lack of exploration of the library itself, a missed opportunity. I do agree with that part. I wanted to see more of the library. Mm, yeah, me too. But I, I always will. <laughs> yeah. I also have to ask if the criteria for passing the test is the same for everyone, or is it catered to the individual because all the qualities listed seem very geared toward a human or human like mentality. And we know that star Trek has multiple species whose brains work differently than that. Not to mention all the different cultures who might approach such concepts differently philosophically, like a species who don't believe in feeling guilty or who work to purge the ability to feel fear of anything, etc. Basically Vulcan wouldn't pass it without being untrue to their nature. I don't agree with you on the Vulcan thing because the Vulcans are emotional. They just hide it. And they subdue it. Well, and this is a, I mean, it, the problem is, is, is this test isn't perfect. Like this test is created by whatever, like 32nd, 22nd century people or 23rd century people. It's not 24th like fourth century. The, okay. But mirror verse 23rd, maybe no, 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 she was 24th century for sure. She was, or was she? Okay. Yeah, she 24th. was. She was definitely twenty fourth century. Sorry, I get confused because I think of twenty three hundred and twenty third as the same, but they're they're not. Yeah, but <laughs> 20, she's still a flawed so individual. Twenty three hundred beta Z. Right, she's a flawed individual. It's not like these are like I think the way they're pro- pro- uh, projecting this season makes it sort of feel like they're trying to do this like almost godlike. Like, let's examine these lowly humans and make sure they're as evolved as we are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but they're just a group of people yeah. that, like, and I, and I feel like the show is trying to push this idea of that, like, this is a, they were passing these tests to earn the right to have the same access to the progenitor technology that they had 800 years ago, but didn't have trust. But the pro- the reason they had, they, they, they hit it wasn't because like they weren't good enough to hold the technology. It was because they didn't trust the state of the universe at that time. Yeah. They were in the middle of the dominion war. Yeah. And I don't feel like the state of the universe is much better at this point. So I don't, I don't know. Like it, it feels like the tests are geared toward making sure that the person who finds it or the crew who finds it is evolved enough, mm-hmm. which isn't the issue they had 800 years ago. So it feels a little weird. It feels more like you'd want to like, Hey, what's going on in society right now? Is there major wars happening? Are the brain a big threat? You know, like it it seems weird the way they're uh they're viewing the tests versus what the tests were actually created for. Yeah, but you know, I think there's also I uh, you know, they're being brought into this by Kovic and we don't know what his true intentions are. 100% or what his yeah. deal is. But Kovic is saying, hey, look, people are after this thing, so it's either us or them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which which is kind of the worst way 
Like, so in, in that sense, I feel like if they do get there, the answer should be like, yeah, the universe is not ready for this yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, maybe hide it for another 800 years. <laughs> yeah. So there's like, they're, they're going to get there. I'm going to be so pissed if they get there. And it's like the preserver, the uh, preserver technology with, was within you all along, Michael Burnham. Yeah, I was just like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I hear you, man. There's some real Oz vibes right now. <laughs> all right. Uh, what, is that, um, was that all from Stu? No, no. Uh, <laughs> Stu says, also, Rune just majorly acted stupid in a manner that I felt designed to accelerate the plot in a way that didn't feel believable and use the sci-fi trope of how a character knows a couple of specific things about a culture. So it's basically a cheat code to manipulating them because they don't th- they won't think laterally and realize it's happening. Also, brain xenophobia is completely overwritten just because the alien they look down on is married to their dead, presumed future leader who isn't guaranteed a resurrection. And yes, the plot overall this season has culminated in Discovery doing all the work and finding the clues and then giving them to the brain, and the whole thing could have been avoided by destroying even one of the clues they had, and it likely would have had the same result, because I doubt the season is going to end with, and the Federation got the power to control and create all life, and they used it totally wisely to fix everything, <laughs> and everyone lived happily ever after. <laughs> Agreed. It will not end that way. Um, uh, and, hey, Discovery has not done all the work. They were given a list of names by yeah. Kovic. Someone else out in the Federation found out the names of the scientists. Maybe in the Federation. So, he just has sources and yeah, legal well, pads. That's all he's got is sources well, and legal pads. If nothing else, it's Kovic. Kovic is the source of the Federation. He did like figure out a way to get the names. So they're, they, so, someone else is working on things. Yeah. And then they also <laughs> handed over the ISS Enterprise to go do Federation things. But, you know. Disco is uh is one of their they're not the flagship but they uh they pretend to be I don't know who the flagship is at this point but uh ah. they they are they are uniquely uh set up to jump around space and that gives them you know power yeah they probably should be the flagship <laughs> yeah yeah I don't know it's it's weird because it's like. It's just weird. I feel like I want, I want more like just sitting around and them figuring out like, how what does it mean to have this group from eight hundred years ago as a part of our Starfleet? Like them joining Starfleet and then not really integrating. They sort of just stayed on their own ship. It all just feels kind of like weird. I guess I don't know. Hmm. Like I want to, I want more discussions about that. Like I want, I want a little more like fleshing out of their relationship to the Federation and like how that works. Cause they're like, yeah, it's 800 years later. The Federation's changed a lot. Like what, it, in what ways has it changed? That they need to learn and they deal with that on occasion, but it feels more like they just keep thrusting them into like these universe ending stakes that they have to f- just be the point point person for at all times. Yeah. I think, I think the problem somewhat is that you and I, and I don't know, I don't hear anybody else say this kind of shit. (laughs) I think you and I are the kind of Star Trek fans who would be completely happy with every episode just being them exploring what the hell is is going on in this time frame. Like... Just like, let's just have them all sit around and like, let's go visit what's left of the Klingon home world. Right. Let's see them well, go hang I out. Would, uh, I, don't, I don't think I would like that, but what I would like, what I wouldn't mind is just like a basic, they get, they're, they jump 800 years forward, Federation still is what it is, or it's not necessarily falling apart, they don't have to save it, they just have to learn to live within it at this time frame, and like, they end up being like a lower decks type ship, and they end up like working little odd, like, jobs that don't matter as much but it kind of world builds what the Mm -hmm. universe looks like and they sort of rise through the ranks instead of coming and being like the savior of the federation you know what i mean and then that sort of automatically puts them in this position where they get like all the best gigs yeah i have wanted to see more of the other those crazy looking ships yeah the federation doing something absolutely absolutely like get i don't know 
I, I know, I know it was, it's, it's a budget thing and everything else, but them upgrading the discovery with the new, you know, warp nacelles and stuff. And like, it's very cool looking, but like, yeah, I'd love to see what the actual new ships look like and really get to explore all that stuff. Mm hmm. Uh, Stu finishes and says, still more enjoyable than last season, though. Um, <laughs> I think he's been ending his uh, ending his that way lately. <laughs> it's yeah. like, here's my problems. Still better than last season. <laughs> here's my bitch list, and I still like it more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I um, I think I mostly agree with him. I I have a bitch list, but I also like it more than last season. It's been a it's been a more solid season than I think the DMA season or whatever. Yeah, it's been about as solid as Locke. <laughs> More solid every day. <laughs> now he's downright rig- rigor mortis filled. Filled with the with the rigor. <laughs> All right. Any other uh, feedback? Uh, no, that's everything as far as I know. Cool. Well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, guys, for writing in. Um, any other thoughts on this episode? Um, I am just looking forward to the last two episodes. We have two episodes of Discovery wow. left ever. Wow, I can't believe that. I, I'm really hopeful they'll be great. Me too. Um, I think they they've set it up in a like we're in a cool place. They've got the whole puzzle. Where you know, last season they got to those like light aliens in the last two episodes or whatever, and that was yeah. really fun. I really enjoyed it. And this one, I think. Because it's less about communication, it's more about like this power of the you know creation of life and the progenitors and all this stuff. Like, I really hope we get, um, I hope we get to like really contact the preservers or whatever, like or the progenitors or yeah, whatever, whatever you want to call them. I really hope we get the chance to see those pe those because like we know that this cabal has been le- that has been leading them here. It is from 800 years ago. We know what those people are like. We've seen that that era in Star Trek. But I'm hoping whenever they get to the technology that it gives them a glimpse of uh, another glimpse like we got in Next Generation of the progenitors. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what they do with that. Yeah, I am very interested to see what happens. Yeah, man. Um, all right. Well, uh, I guess we'll get out of here. Yeah. Good, to, good chatting with you, Dave. It's good chatting with you too, man. Thanks. Thank you. Joel on True. Live long. Prosper. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 